lowest uh, initial cholesterol, and then the second lowest initial cholesterol, right? And we block them together, and one got the treatment, or the new treatment, and the other one got the current. Because I had a block that was very similar, I directly compared their data before doing averages, right? So it, it matters, are you going to subtract the data values before you do averages in your confidence interval? And that's because they're very similar in some way. That's when you're going to do a paired set of data. Um, I'm going to show you from the notes, again, another example. But it's whenever the two, whenever it's not just, hey, here's a sample and I find the average. Here's a sample, I find the average. And then I do the confidence interval. So if you do the averages before the confidence interval or the averages before the test, that's a two sample. If you find the difference first, because they're very closely related, right? So if you find the difference first because they're really closely related, that's a pair. Matched pairs or just a paired set of data. So we'll look at another example in a second. But if you use twins, right? Yeah. If you use lotion and you put lotion on one arm versus another arm, right? It's the same person, right? So super similar. Then I would look at the difference between that person, not all right arms versus all left arms. If it's all right arms versus all left arms, that would be two sample. But I'm going to look at that person first. So the or the new treatment versus the old. Okay. Okay, so we're going to look at one more example to help um, and try to explain there. So it says when to use T versus Z. Yeah. Okay, when do we use Z? Okay, so if we have the population standard deviation, if you have sigma, you can use Z. Okay. That is super rare. So right. we don't use Z for means. Oh, for, for the most part. Right. Gotcha. right. We don't really use Z for means because it's very rare that you wouldn't have the population mean, but you have the population standard deviation. It's a super rare occurrence. Um, so for the most part, if you see means, use the T distribution. Okay. So then the question over here, how does degrees of freedom affect the tail? It doesn't affect the tail-ish. I, I think I understand a little bit about what you're asking. It more affects the distribution, the T distribution. So let's say here is my Z, my standard normal curve, right? Standard normal. So if I have a sample size of, let's say, 3, what would be my degrees of freedom? 2. 2, okay. And if it's a degrees of freedom of 2, right? The tail is further out, but the real reason why is that data is more um, spread. There's a higher level of variance, a higher level for the standard deviation, right? The big difference between the T distribution and the standard normal distribution is there's more spread here, so it doesn't follow the empirical rule, right? The T distribution wouldn't, it's more spread out. But what would it look like if my, my sample size was 20? What would my degrees of freedom now be? 19. 19. And so what, how would it look in comparison between the degrees of freedom of 2 and the standard normal? It would be somewhere in between. right? So it's less spread out. You see how it's there. So as we increase our degrees of freedom, the spread decreases and it gets closer to the standard normal curve. So notice how there's less spread, or, yeah, there's less area in the tails. But it's more about that spread in general, right? So if you have a higher degrees of freedom, then it gets, um, has less spread is the, the big idea. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Go for it, Ashley. A brief uh, explanation of the difference between mean difference and difference in means. Like so, a mean difference, that's your paired data. Because you are looking at a mean of the differences. So you take your differences first and you do a mean of the differences. Whereas if it's a difference of means, you have two means, and you're taking the difference of those two means. 
What is a mean difference is you have already found the differences. You find the mean of those differences. So shouldn't that come out the same? You like. So these will be exactly the same. However, the confidence interval and the standard deviation would be very different, right? And the degrees of freedom. So notice with two sample like this, that's when you would use S1 squared divided by N1 plus S2 squared divided by N2. And the degrees of freedom formula there is ugly. Notice you're going to have more spread here because you had to add those variances. Okay. Whereas here, you're going to add or subtract T times the standard deviation of the differences divided by the sample size of those differences. So basically, you use a mean difference to get a smaller spread. Yeah, right. So a mean difference, one, again, it has to be that paired data, which we're going to look at an example from the homework to help answer Deacon's question. But you take a difference of all the values, and then you average the differences. So it is literally an average of differences. This is a difference of means. And so this point estimate would be exactly the same. The margin of error would be very different. Okay. So this will have more spread. It will have a higher margin of error. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, that looks to answer all the questions I think there were. Again, by the way, guys, if you have questions throughout, please ask those. I cannot read your minds, but I would love to answer those questions. So I would sent out uh, solutions to these sets of notes. So I'm not going to go heavily over these. If you have questions, let me know. But notice right here, I have no clue how to pronounce any of these names, right, Deacon? But this is the cat's response to the fourth noun. This is the cat's response to their name. Okay. You see how both of those values come from the same cat? Sure. So I can easily take a difference to find out how the um, cat's response compares. And so the difference would be negative 1.2. Because these values are paired around this one cat, I'm going to do a pair. I'm going to work this as a paired set of data. So it has it's to not be on the same individual. It doesn't have to be on the same individual. So remember, but a lot of times, Deacon, it will be. So one, a lot of times it will be. But it, or it could be a matched pairs design. So remember how with the cholesterol example, right? Yeah. We couldn't do the same cholesterol uh, treatments on the same people, but we paired them together based on who had the lowest weights, right? And the two lowest weights, one of them got the new treatment, one of them got the current treatment. Then we did the next two lowest weights because they're very similar. And so that, by the way, those two, that matched pairs is a block, right? So the two lowest weights is a block, and we randomly assign the treatments within that block, but they are paired together. Then we did the next two. I still don't understand how that's different from two samples. Like from... Because it ends up being one sample. You so, subtract the two to make one sample. But, okay, so first off, when I find my differences, how many values am I looking at? Am I looking at two individual samples? Or am I looking at one single sample now? One single sample. Right. And so I'm going to find a mean of those differences. So if I subtract those two values, which actually is technically the other way around. So 1 minus 2.2, 0 0.5 minus 1, 2.7 minus 0 0.6. Once I subtract, right, the individual values, right, I'm not subtracting the means. I'm subtracting these individual values. And because I'm subtracting these individual values, I am now left with a one sample that is just the differences. The two sample would be if I find the mean of all these values, and I find the mean of all these values, and after I find the means, I subtract. But I am subtracting to find the difference because these two are directly related. These two are directly related. These two are directly related. And because they are directly related, I subtract first and then do the different, and then find the confidence interval based on that. Bless you. Bless you. So if you have a matched pairs design where you have two individuals that are very similar, again, the example of twins, right? And one twin gets one treatment and the other twin gets the other treatment, 
and you subtract the values before doing the interval, before doing the hypothesis testing, that's a difference. I right. right. Yep. So, but if you have two different samples, you average the samples and then do your inference procedure, that's a two sample. So think about... So like for match pairs, you're like comparing them directly, but with two samples, you're doing like the actual like set of data against the other one. It's so hold on. Put my brain. hold on to your question, because I, I was thinking and not fully listening to your question. I apologize for that. Right. But if you do means first, then inference procedure, so that you have a mean minus another mean, that's two samples. If you do a difference first, then means, then a mean, because if you do the difference first, you're left with one set of data, then mean of one set of data, that is now paired data. Okay. So if you do a difference first, then the mean of that one set of data, so you have paired data, and then you do that inference procedure. Gotcha. So this is the paired data set, this is the two sample set. Does that help explain it? Yep. Does that help explain it over here? Okay. Oh, uh, before they yell at me, I need to mark that Josh is absent. Again, if there's a significant <coughs> relationship between two individual pieces of data, you would do the difference first and then subtract. And so I guess there's actually one example of this. Again, we have solutions for all this, but right here. So Deacon, before exiting the water, the scuba divers remove their fins. Maker of scuba equipment advertises a new style of fins. So a consumer advocacy group suspects the time uh, maybe no different, so 20 experienced scuba divers are recruited to test new fins. They flip a coin to determine if they wear the new fin on the left and the old fin on the right. See so, you how know, it is one individual, and so one foot has one fin, the other has the other fin, and then they test those. So I'm not going to do two averages and then subtract. The average. So well, I'm going to find the average. difference and then, and then the averages. <coughs> Does that yep. help? But here in this one, right, we have 60 white piranha fish uh, from the Amazon, and then we have 82 white piranha from the same tributary a decade ago. One, you see how they have different sample sizes? Yeah. If they had different sample sizes, you can't do a difference of each individual. Two, six, a decade ago, that's not going to affect here. So, so you see how these are independent? Got gotcha. you. Right, so that's another thing. If they are independent samples, they, they can't be paired samples. data. Right. Gotcha. Did you have your hand up? Uh, so I was saying, like, so is it? Can you just tell it's paired data if it's like pertaining to like the same, I guess, sample? If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, in a lot of ways. I guess another way to think about it is also. I think this somewhat ties into what you're saying. If they are independent samples, one sample does not affect the other sample. Then it's two sample. But if they are heavily related, they're not independent samples, right? So the cat example earlier, the response to their name versus the fourth noun, they are very heavily re related. Those are not two independent samples. Okay. And so if they're not independent, they have to be paired. Yeah, okay. Or you can't do the inference procedure. Yeah. Uh, off topic, are we going over the AP review questions? It was like 18 questions. Yeah, that was part of the bell ringer was to write up any questions you had. No, we ain't doing all of them. Well, we just the answers. I sent them to oh, you. Oh, you did? Yes. Oh, I don't care. Okay, okay. <laughs> check the check the answers, and then if you have questions, let me know. Makes a lot more sense. Yes, Tyler. So, is independence uh, condition like not the independence from probability? 
Okay. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, yeah not the point. independence from probability. One sample being independent of the selection of the other sample, right? 60 white piranha fish today is independent of 82 white piranha fish from a decade ago. Right? They do not affect each other. That's the idea. And so there is the idea they do not affect each other that's the same, but don't fit probability. Um, and then this one was, yeah, it, there's no way to directly correlate the two, so we would not use independence here. Uh, conditions for a significance test, how do those difference differ from uh, confidence interval? Okay. How do uh, conditions for a test differ from a confidence interval? Oh, and I still need to do your progress check question. I'll do that in just a second. Even, even just think about it, how conditions for a significance test versus the conditions for a confidence interval. Um, so for calculation. Sounds like we did not check our answers. It's the same. They're exactly the same. Yeah. There is no difference in those conditions. Well, the conditions for a hypothesis test are the same conditions for a confidence interval. What are those conditions? Random, 10%, and large counts. Now, or not large counts. No. Large counts was for what? Normality. So, so large counts was prob or proportions. You can use the central limit theorem as uh, long as the sample size is what? Sufficiently, Sufficiently large. large, which we use 30 or greater. So you can do that. What else would allow us to move forward? So if what's a normal? The population. The population distribution is uh, approximately normal. Or if the sample is symmetric. Or if that sample is roughly symmetric. There's no extreme skewness, no outliers, then you can do it there. <laughs> All right. Um, so what test statistic do we use when testing a population mean? T, usually. Yeah, T, unless you have sigma, right? But yeah, T. Is the full formula on the formula sheet, by the way? No. Probably not. Probably not, but it's there in a lot of ways. You can build it. So what is the test statistic in general? If we look at that formula sheet, I want you to always have that formula sheet next to your notes. So if we look at the formula sheet and we look at a hypothesis test, what does it say? Stat minus parameter over standard oh, error. Okay, so what does that equal to? What does it say on the formula sheet? Standard test statistic. Standardized test statistic. Yeah. Right, so we're standardizing that test statistic and it is stat, stat minus, minus parameter over standard error. And so in all reality, our hypothesis test tells us a lot. If my hypothesis test is about mu, what's the parameter? Mu. Mu. Okay. Peyton, what would the statistic be, though, estimating this parameter? Because it's not on the formula sheet, but you need to know this. What estimates mu? So which one is it? So here's all the symbols we've got. And S. Which one do we use? Which one estimates mu? Use X bar. X bar. You've got to know that off the top of your head. Right. What symbol do we use for standard error? Sigma or S typically, right? Because we usually don't have sigma, but S sub X bar, and this is what the formula sheet does give you. What is uh, the standard error of X bar? This is where you want to use that formula sheet. It's S, what? Divided by the square root of N. Okay, so that formula sheet is crucial in helping you remember these inf this information, which is why, and we're not there yet, but I want to go ahead and remind you, 
if I want the standard deviation of x bar 1 minus x bar 2, can you just add or subtract those standard deviations? So you, need the variance. you need the variance, right? Which is just what? Standard deviation squared. Square. Square. Variance is just standard deviation squared. And would I subtract those two standard deviations? No. Add them. Yeah. The variance, can variance can only increase. Okay. And then you would just use, again, this idea right here to rewrite this. Notice how I have squared it, right? S squared divided by N because I squared. S2, the variance of S2, or variance of 2, divided by the sample size. And this is on the formula sheet, but I'm just reminding you where it's coming from. What would I do once I add those variances? Oh, I need to take the square root, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm adding those variances, take the square root here. And so standard deviation of x bar 1 minus x bar 2, is that on the formula sheet? Yeah. Very much so. So they don't give you the standardized test statistics completely, but they give you all those pieces. Make sure you pay attention to that. Okay. The T distribution is very clearly laid out in the <coughs> book. Um, I sent you the notes that I created. If you look through it and have a question tomorrow, that can be a part of your bell ringer. Okay. Same thing here with these. Where, do any of you know if you have a specific question on this page? That's where I got my details <laughs> question from. Okay. So notice because it's not equal to, right? That's where we do those two tails. Yes, ma'am. I use, I don't know if it's technically the same formula. It's not the same. Which one? Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay. So, <laughs> what Lexi is asking about is she found this. That should look very familiar, but what's the dip? So, what is she kind of stressing about that is a little bit different? The mu sub zero, right? But what does this mean? That's the hypothesized <coughs> mu. Right? That's the only reason why it has that subscript there is because it's referring to the null hypothesis. Do we need to put that there? No. Really no, you do not need to put that there. That's just what the textbook has. Is everything else good with that? Okay. How do you do those? That set of notes? A and B. Yeah. I just, I just, so I just, do I. I just don't. And here was a practice question with a confidence interval. Why did I put this here? This was earlier, wasn't it? Oh, no, 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 no. no, no. I got it now. Sorry, I was looking at B and forgetting. This is what I did not. Did I assign this one? You said do that page. Okay, I did say do that page. Um, so, I'm just going to quickly cover a couple of details with this. All right. Haley, if it asks in A, do these data provide convincing evidence at that alpha level? What's the first thing you should think about? There we go. State, plan, do, conclude. So make sure you always think through those things. Um, the big thing though, I will say this, the do section, can you use your calculator for that? Yes. 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 Right. Okay. Very much so. Be careful as you type everything into the calculator. How do you even do the p value on the calculator? So hold on to that question. Try it tonight. Look at the notes and then I'll answer it tomorrow if you don't. Fully know. I mean, I looked at the notes, I just, I just don't get where the numbers are coming from. Well, remember, p value is the problem. I know what p value is, I just don't know how to find it. Just well, it's the value you put in. Yeah, I just don't know what it is. You use TCDF. The length of 
Here's your lower bound. Can we have a thank you for checkout, please? He's on his way. Thank you. So, you use your lower bound of that area. So, remember, the p value is the shaded area. I know what it is. That's not a pine. TCDF, hit menu, go to distributions. Go to TCDF. That's all I need to know. I just didn't know where to go. Remember, you're using a T, T distribution. And CDF is that cumulative density function. Exactly. Okay. Um, okay, do section. Make sure you write out at least your equation here. And then fill in whatever the calculator gives you, at least the mean and the margin of error. Um, but state plan do conclude. This, again, what's my null hypothesis in this case? That uh, the mean would be six. They claim it's six. What's our alternative? Uh, so I would use the two tail not equal to six. Now, remember what the calculator spits out. I don't know why I put a confidence interval here. Um, T is equal to whatever the sample mean is minus that hypothesized mean of 6. And so whatever p-value the calculator spits out is the correct p-value. You don't need to double that. The p-value the calculator spits out is the correct p-value. So p -value. even if it's two-tailed, it's still going to be correct. Because the calculator knows that it's two-tailed. Because remember, you put the alternative that's not equal to. Mm -hmm. And so the calculator goes ahead and spits out the correct p-value. So what about putting in the wrong one on accident? Would I need to like double it? Or, like, this is like completely random, by the way. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, but like if you put in the greater I mean, it would than. would still work. Now, you need to be careful because if you do greater than and your t is here, it's going to give you all of this. Yeah. And you need to recognize, like, so you that p value should always be less than my When you do the TCDF, okay. do you use? Would you like recommend standard, like doing using the t score? You need that. You have to use the t score. Okay. That's why I always recommended that you convert to z scores early on. So, but uh, yes, Ashton, if you did greater than, and it gave you this tail, you would just double it. But I would just be careful and make sure you hit not equal to. Okay. Yes, Tyler. Is the that formula you just wrote, would it be, isn't it just S over square root of N, or is it S sub? Did I write the, you said you wrote S, S sub X over Yeah, one. you're right, it's S. Yeah, thank you. This is the sample mean. Yeah, that would be the standard error, the sample means. Yeah, it's just S. It's S sub X is what I meant to write, the standard deviation of X. Okay. I don't think I really had you do this, did I? No. This is where I had you stop? Okay. <clears throat> um, so let's look at pages 711 to 712. Deacon, can, can you hit the lights for me? Oh, I actually also need to answer Deacon's question first. Oh, you're my bad, Deacon. No, you live up where you are. No. What if you read yeah, the question there? Say again, sir? If you're kidding. Oh, awesome. Um, well, you were kidding right now. There you go. I don't know what this is. So. And I will point out. So nine of us so far have done these progress checks, all in the green, so that's really exciting. Um, make sure you are tackling these, taking the time to really read through those, um, because you do have the skills you need for this. No, that's not what I want. Font size. Do you can, maybe you can read that? No. Even though it's not. Let me make it huge. 
All right. Well, I memorized the question. You memorized the question? Photographic memory. All right. So researchers studying the sticky droplets found on spider webs will measure the widths of a random sample of droplets from the sample. The researchers will conduct a 95% confidence interval to estimate the mean width of all such droplets. Which of the following statements about a 95% confidence interval for the mean width is correct? The interval will be narrower if the researchers increase the level of confidence to 99%. No? No. Why not? Because it's wrong. Why is it wrong? To have a greater confidence, you have to have a bigger interval. Yeah. Right? So that type lies it would eliminate yeah. A and C. But, oh, I see what they're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, they're saying, not saying that interval is narrower. So yeah, if we increase our confidence, what has to happen? The interval has to be wider because our margin of error will be larger. Our margin of error will be larger. Remember, the standard error, the sample mean would all stay the same, but your T star would be larger. The interval will be narrower if the researchers increase the sample size. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Deacon, remember how with our standard error we always divide by the square root of n? Yeah. And if we're dividing by a larger number, it's going to decrease the interval width. Got you. Right. Yeah. Alright, we're good then. And so it'll be narrower if we decrease the level of confidence. If you increase the sample size again, it'll make the interval narrower. And it's definitely not E. Gotcha. Questions about that one? So remember higher levels of confidence, widen the interval to make sure that we have a higher chance of capturing the parameter. Um, increasing the sample size decreases that margin of error because it decreases the standard error. Okay, oh, pages 711 to the... I don't know why I closed. I wish we had 711 here. What's up? I wish we had 711 up here. They're fine. Huh? You don't have 711 in South? No. No, no they no, have no, them all over Florida, but they're not in Alabama. 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 Florida is Florida. 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 What did I say, page 711? The yes. place so, guys, do not forget to use your textbook as a resource. It is a fantastic resource. I don't like it. If we had an in person one, that'd be so good. I know it doesn't. But no, it would, I'd never read it. I would read it so much more. If my iPad's always there. Is there is there an in person? Copy? I'll pay for it right now. I'll buy it. Also, you can do so, it on your phone. So, what, another but two it's weeks? Hey, small. Guys. It's tiny. Yo, hey, it's pretty You can always make it a larger... <laughs> hey, chill. So, um, the idea of statistical significance versus practical importance. So, if, let's just say that, um, so we have this example of mu equals 7.6 and mu is less than 7.6 as our alternative. Let's say my sample mean is 7.5. On the surface, right, I, I can increase my sample size large enough that I find statistical significance. Right, so I'm going to make my sample size like a thousand. I'm going to let my standard deviation be five. Even with, okay, that might be extreme. It's the lowest standard deviation. Mr. Kenny, I got the thing where I zero. Good. Yeah. So let's think about this. What does it mean to be statistically significant? Uh, so the chance, right, so it's the p-value is less than alpha. alpha. And so with such a high sample size, it is likely to get a p-value less than alpha, right? Mm -hmm. It would be statistically significant, meaning it's unlikely to get that sample by chance alone. But in practicality, is that different enough for us to care? So that's the thing to pay attention to. That's all this section is saying. And so even if it had been 7.55, is it less? Yeah. 7.55 less than the mean? Yeah. Or the oh, hypothesized yes. value? Yes. yes. But is it enough difference that we would say, yeah, we reject our null hypothesis? I guess not. How do you, how can you tell if it's not enough? What do you, what do you call it then? Yeah, how do you, how can you tell? If what? Oh. If it's enough difference or not. You said if it's enough to care? Yeah. I mean, just legitimately, like, this is a difference of 0 0.05. Yeah, but... Is that... I feel like that could be very... 
Yeah, what is it? It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, listen. They're not testing on us on on this on the AP exam. Okay, good. Okay, but and that's because it's wishy-washy. There's no like firm answer. But there is, in a statistical sense, an important idea of yes, I can show statistical significance, but in practicality, does it is it enough different that I really would no. care? Probably not. Probably not. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's all they're saying through here, right here. Statistical significance, right? So right here, this result is not practically important. Having uh, your scab fall off one tenth of a day sooner is no big deal. And so that's what the problem was about. Statistical significance is not the same thing as practical importance. You can increase your sample size to the point where you always have statistical significance. You can but practically does it matter? And that's a question that you would have to ask yourself. It's just in the sense of real world application, not in the sense of the AP exam. Okay? So are they going to test you on statistical significance versus practical importance? No. no. Definitely not, right? Um, but that's the idea that they're talking about here with the problem of multiple tests is I can keep running tests, getting different samples, and that's another thing. Could I do an, I get a sample here at 7.55, could I do another sample and get 7.45 and, and find statistical significance that way? Yes, but is it practically important, right? So I can keep running tests until I find one that fits the data, but y'all seen, in, I assume, hopefully, in history and in science classes, You've talked about people who kind of fudged the numbers or kept running tests until they found mm -hmm. strong mm -hmm. enough evidence for what they wanted. That's what they did, right? Like they ran multiple tests until they got one case that worked. But if I have one case that works and like 300 that don't, is that really statistically significant? Is it practically important? No. No. And so uh, be wary of study designs that... Um, run multiple tests. So, so statistical significance there. versus practical importance. What? Like if we were, I know you said the AP exam not tested. Did you test on something no. that's subjective? No. Okay. No. No. But it's an important statistical concept. So yeah. it, I need to address it. Yeah. Okay. So please note progress check B um, in that email that I sent yesterday, which you need to check your emails. I told you that I think the progress check, if I didn't tell you progress check B needs to be done tonight, you need to get it done tonight. Um, again, I will point this out, for those, for the most part, when I went in and checked time domains, for those who are legitimately reading through the progress checks, it's taking 14 to 15 minutes. It's not a terribly long amount of time. It took me a long Huh? It took me a long time. I was like not fully focusing on it while I was doing it. Right. I, if I don't have my phone, I'll be doing 15, 20 minutes. Right. I have my phone, I might be on my So put your phone away while you do your yeah. progress check. Ah. Ah. So, no, I'm not. I'm really not. I'm asking yeah, you to be wait. ready for I was AP still exam. I was still, like, trying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, no, I'm just just on Instagram. What? That's not true. You're not out of the running I'll yet. None of you are. Okay. Wait, when is the, the exam again? The AP exam? Yeah. It's the last week of the first. It's, the, it's Thursday of the last full week of May. So whatever that is. So we won't be in school. Yeah, but I'll still be doing, we'll be doing a review that whole week if you want to come in just for that block. See, now that's a little after. Yeah, when do I go? Once I'm done with school. Wait, what's All right. I'm not coming back. Okay. Yeah, which is why they're pushing the pump. Maybe it's seven. Hold on, where's my phone? Oh, yes, seven. Wait, it's our last day? No, it can't be that. Mr. Arles, what day did you graduate? The fourth? We need to go. Yeah. So it's the ninth. Y'all's is on the ninth. Y'all's AP exam is the ninth. Oh, uh, You're the ninth. Because ours is on the Thursday. And the second is a Thursday. 
the you just I mean, made I need to go back and my fair fair. I need to go back and check, but I'm pretty sure. I can't go to the Spanish it's club dance. It's on Tuesday. It's on Tuesday? Yeah. Yes. That's the only class. Oh, yeah. I thought it was on a Thursday. Wait, what? I need to go back and check. Well, just look at AP. Yeah, what are we doing with that? What are we doing? Okay, how are we going to make that work? I'm not going. All AP stats, same day across the country. I'm just going to skip grad. Hey, regardless. Let's, hey, yeah. guys, let's schedule for I'm to try it. Man, I've been on, working on the wrong assumption this whole time. That sucked. That might. All right, we got to push in even more than I thought. I thought we had two more days. So listen, what are the, so yeah, what are the conditions for performing a two-sample t-test for a difference in means? So notice a difference in means, right? That means we have two means. We're doing the difference of them. Back. What are the conditions? Random. Okay, it's got to be random. Same. It's got to be uh, independent. And independent, right? We need independent random samples. Need so if you see that independence, that's when you're thinking to sample for difference in mean. Besides that, it's Then it needs to be, um, and I will say I read in the book this weekend, and I like this, that they say um, normal or large or large slash normal because if it's a normal uh, population the sampling distribution is approximately normal if it's a large sample the sampling distribution is approximately normal so the big one to remember here is the central limit theorem and samples are what okay so and so they are not heavily skewed or outliers. So, last one. Ten percent. Ten percent, right? Is that not independence? So, independence. remember that's the independence of one oh, sample yeah. from another, or one subject from another in a single sample. This independence is the two samples are independent of each other. So when it's two samples, you need independent random samples. So one sample selection doesn't affect the other sample selection. In an experiment, does it have to be independent? No. Good question. With an experiment, it does not have to be independent. So in this, which independence does that talk about in an experiment? Like that, is it the Independent. Say again. Like when you don't need <coughs> independence in an experiment, which independence do you not need? Neither. Neither? Yeah. All right. So for the first independence is next to random. Is that just something that you pretty much just given by like, like is there a way to so, check for that with math or is it just kind of given in the problem? It'll have to be given. Just like random is going to have to be given in the problem. Gotcha. It's two independent random samples. It'll have to be given in the problem. Okay. No mathematical way to check that. Okay. Formula for the two sample T statistic. Now, standardized test statistic has never changed. Mm -hmm. What is standardized test statistic? Stat minus parameter. So stat minus parameter divided by standard error. Look at that formula sheet. Thinking through it. So I would always start with my parameter. If I'm looking at a difference in means, right? What would my parameter be? It'd be a mean one minus mean two. Mu one minus mu two. Now, Logan, with a test statistic or with a hypothesis test, what's that difference usually going to be? Zero. It's usually going to be zero, right? Usually, uh, when we do this, that difference will be zero. But even if it's not zero, it's still just mu one minus mu two. So usually zero. And so Haley, what estimates mu1 minus mu2? But I need mu1 minus mu2, so I need two things. X bar 1. There you go, right? Bless you. All right, Alyssa. Standard error. This is an ugly one, but how are we going to find it? Okay. 
Okay, square root. So like this? No. I said on the other one, so separate. Okay, so below the S one. Okay. It's just a matter of finding it. And remember, you're not going to have to do all of these calculations. Substitute in, and then what are we going to use? <laughs> We're going to use the calculator. Right? Substitute into formula. Sketch your T distribution. with your critical value and shading and report P. That's it. Substitute into the formula, sketch your T distribution with the critical value and shading and report your P value. do this practice problem at our vertical surfaces. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's a great question. <coughs> Hey, we're oh. at Madison. Let's go. Hold on. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so we're down to 11. I feel like it happened. Yeah, yeah. Then there was 11. Yeah. yeah. So in a second, these are the groups we're going to move to, but hold on because Lexi did have a good question. She said, what about the degrees of freedom? So, degrees of freedom with this two sample, what are we going to do? So we're just going to use calculator. Remember, your calculator will spit out the degrees of freedom. Right? Do we pull? Never. Do not pull on the calculator. What does that mean? Don't worry about it. Just don't do it. How do I know how to do avoid it if I don't know what it is? Just never do it. Just ne you will never use pooling. Is okay. that under yeah, the pool we can grab? That was that's 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 very good. <laughs> that's not it's kind of very good. We'll practice in a second. Okay. So use your calculator to get your degrees of freedom. Gosh darn. Um, now, in these groups, I want you to to notice right here, it talks about pooling. We're gonna talk about it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we have to. So move to these vertical surfaces. I need you actively talking, making sure everyone in the group understands. As I come around, what are we doing? As Mr. Arliss comes around, we're doing the next, the practice problem on the next part of this. So right there, yeah, that practice problem. If you forget to draw the distribution, do you get that off? Did you still get it right? Hopefully not, but it's. You need to report the degrees of freedom, um, and it's, it's helpful visually for them to see that you understand what's going on. Okay. Uh, context. Um, so I just said it's a. Or sorry, not context, conclude. Oh, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. We don't. So we fail to reject what? The null hypothesis. Now, could you include context here? Yes, I just make it simple though. Fail to reject the null hypothesis because the p-value equals 0 0.0988, which is greater than alpha equal to 0. Point. Actually, what was our alpha in this one? It didn't specify. It did not specify, so we assume 0.05, that sounds good. 
Now, if it was 0 0.1, what would we do? Reject we would reject, but alpha, if it's not stated, alpha 0 0.05 is safe to assume. So, we have a statement about the null hypothesis. We compare the p to alpha. And so, there is or is not statistically significant evidence. There is not statistically significant evidence for, and then your context. Remember, for this context, make sure you did your state well and just pull directly from the state portion. Right, so whatever you said in the state portion, uh, so that the difference in mean score on white paper versus mean score on yellow paper, or that there is no difference in the mean score on white paper versus mean score on yellow paper. Right, I would just pull directly from that state portion. Does that make sense? So make sure, ooh, there is no difference in the true mean scores on white paper minus yellow paper. Okay. What are your questions? Okay. I know I'm going to have to go into advisory. I apologize for that, but we are going to have to do that, demonstrate your understanding. Once you are done, you may head to advisory on email your advisory teachers. Team now works. What? What makes it?